I know um, we talked prior. Um, you've been begging me for months to get on this podcast. I feel like the Lord has something great for you to share with the people because you've been begging for months. Like, T.J., when are you going to let me get on your podcast? When are you going to let me come on your podcast? Yeah. When are you going to let me get, on, get up here and talk? It was like, Cause you know me putting kids on your podcast. <laughs> well, I did record like a whole episode with my kids, but it's just them talking and then it's just, I'm not, I'm not ever airing that because oh. it's, it's terrible. Man. <laughs> it's, 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 it's tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but no, I want, I, this is, I would say a part of me um, investing back into the youth, back into the young adults. Um, I do want to do more with the um, focus youth and with the young adults Mm -hmm. um, because I know that focus youth is mainly like teens. um, But that's where my heart is, uh, to be honest with you. Um, I don't express it much at church because I'm in – 10 million different places. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pulled everywhere. Not wrong. Right. <laughs> um, but that is literally where my heart is. Um, I've always had um, a passion for youth and young adults. Mm-hmm. So a little bit about me. Um, I used to be a camp counselor um, at okay. the YMCA um, when I was in high school. Um, I hated working with the elementary school kids. Mm. Um, it's just something about their cries that just makes me cringe on the inside. And so you can imagine the amount of cringiness I have every time my child screams out and all this stuff. And stuff. <laughs> but I fight through it because that's my child and I love yeah. them and I want to make sure that they're good. But I usually just push them off to their mom. Like, hey, Misha, take care. <laughs> that's all you, Misha. Right. Because Misha is better at the babies. And I and I told her, we we talked about this like even before we even had kids. So you can if you got them from kindergarten or from the time they're babies until they get to middle school, I got them from middle school and on. Because I mean that's that's just my personality. Like yeah. I'm chill, you know. Like I don't yeah. I don't try to do too much, uh, but I will correct you. I mean I will get a be a face, but yo, what you doing? What's up? And all that yeah. good stuff. Um, and that's pretty much that's pretty much how I I kind of developed that um, in high school uh, when I was a camp counselor. Um, and right before I left. Um, and went off to college or, yeah, I was still doing it. Um, and I was actually over the, um, the middle schools, the middle schoolers. And so, and that was pretty cool because you get to see kids in a whole different light when they are fresh out of school and they come straight to camp (laughs) or straight to after school care. Yeah. And so I did all of that. Um, and it was fun. Um, and I just really had a great time. Um, and since then the Lord had put like a, a, a burden on my heart. And the honestly, one of the reasons why I haven't, I would say, fully pursued it is because of lack of, um, I won't even say lack of faith. It's not a lack of faith. It's more of like a lack of connections and a lack of um, resources to make it happen. But yeah. I've always had like a, a burden and a passion to do like a mentoring camp or a mentoring group with a bunch of young, young, um, young boys. Uh, that has always been a passion of mine. And I remember like even throughout my whole entire high school um, tenure, yeah. I would remember. I remember just my prayer was, God, I pray that I meet somebody that is on the path that I want to be on, so that they can pour into me. Um, and so, fortunately, you know, I did have a mentor about junior year into my senior year, um, and and we got connected through my mom. But I had by that time I had left. Your mama hooking you up. She always, she always did. Like she had always had had my back. I was probably the biggest hypocrite in high school. <laughs> Cause so, and you can speak to this a little bit too, because, you know, in high school, you're trying to find your identity. Yeah. You're trying to find who you are, you know, in, in God. But at the same time, you see the popularity of people and you see how people are and you're trying to fit in and whatnot. Yeah. And so I struggled with that trying to fit in. And so because of that, I compromised a whole lot, even though I was a Christian. Yeah. I compromised a whole lot. I'm talking about cussing, drinking, all these other things. Um, and it wasn't until I got connected to my mentor that really helped me to get on the right path. Yeah. And the reason why I say that you can speak to some of this is because um, how do you maintain not conforming, you know, to try to fit in as a young Christian in this day and age and in this society? 
Um, honestly, it wasn't always like this because I was a bad kid in middle school. Like, my mom, <laughs> sure, like she wanted to jerk me up every day. Like when I tell you, I was jumping out the window to leave campus. Like I was bad. Like, I was jumping out the window. <laughs> I was jumping out the window with my friends. We left campus. Like I was vaping, cussing. Like I didn't care because I was just in that phase where it was like, okay, it's just me and I care about myself and nobody else. All right. But. When I got to high school, or, well, at the end of my eighth grade year, I really was like, okay, Marley, grow up. Like, you're fine mm-hmm. now. You're about to go into high school. <laughs> you're like, you're going to go into this <laughs> high school looking like crazy. And yeah. so I told my mom, a high school is going to be better for me. And mm-hmm. so I went to the opposite high school because it's between East Wake and Nightdale usually. And the, I was in Zebulon. So mm-hmm. all the kids went to East Wake, not me. I went to Nightdale. <laughs> so I was separated. And right. that was the best thing for me mm-hmm. to not be with my old friends. Like, do yeah. not. Be around we wrote back, yeah. And so, freshman year, I was this little shy kid. Didn't know, you know, because freshmen aren't going to really talk to right, you. Right, Um, And I found my friend group, and it wasn't the best. Mm-hmm. It was a little rough. <laughs> and then um, I was, like, told, like, I was living a double life, yeah, essentially. And Pastor Mike had preached on, like, living a double double life. life. And then God was like, you see this? You see, this is you. Yeah, yeah. And so I told my friends, like, I'm cutting you off. And Mm. I separated separated from them. And I rocked solo for the most of my freshman year. How hard was that for you? It was hard. Because you see all of your friends going to football games together, going to, like, dances and all this stuff. And I was like, nope, I'm not going to go. Like, I just stayed back. But I did go to football games. And a lot of my friends were gay at the mm-hmm. time yeah and i was like i i support you but mm-hmm. i don't support, support that lifestyle the lifestyle and yeah. they were like well don't talk to me and i was like okay <laughs> so i stepped back from them and then i really was by myself and uh-huh. it took me a long time to like branch out and find better friends mm-hmm. um and then sophomore year happened and i told myself i can rock by myself i did it all last year, like, I can rock by myself and just get it done. Yeah. And Kane, Kane, honestly, wow. like, having Kane to be there and, like, he was my support. Yeah. And he doesn't know that yet because, mm-hmm. like, he's a freshman yeah. and he was in the same boat I am. Yeah. And I told him, like, we got each other. We and got so each other. that's how I kind of maneuvered my yeah. way. See? That's what's up. See? Kane, Kane is who you were or needed. Yeah. Last year. And now you're able to be that for him. Yeah. So that's pretty dope. So Kane, um, for those who don't know who Kane is, he goes to our church. He's a, a youth. Um, he's a freshman, right? Mm-hmm. Freshman. Freshman. Um, and so and he's a pretty dope individual, man. He's yeah. he's hilarious. That dude. That's my nephew. I call him my unofficial nephew. That's my little nephew. Mm-hmm. Um, that boy's off the hook. But I, I like I like how you talked about that because as a young person, you know, you're what? How many weeks in into your sophomore year? Um, I am officially a month in. Yeah, a, a month in. So you got the whole <laughs> <laughs> next few months. Yeah, to really go through some Eight more, more stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> so help help other people your age, um, with navigating through those feelings of well, I just got to be. You know, accepted. I don't want to. I don't want to be saved. I don't want to live a saved life. You know, I'm young. I'm a sophomore. You know, your (laughs) your home hormones are like all over the place. You know, I want to be. You know, with this person and that person. Mm -hmm. Why isn't? Why is that not cool? Like, break that down. For me, I guess I was that person. Like, I was the person who wanted to fit in, Mm -hmm. but I told like. God, like I told God, like I wasn't going to be that person. And I think for kids my age, they they don't want to be leaders. They want to be followers. Right. And especially at the high school I go to, mm-hmm. like if there's a fight, oh yeah, we weren't going to record that. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm not. Who's we? I'm not. Who's we? <laughs> you mean you. Because I'm not doing that. <laughs> right. And I think it's not cool. Like, because why are we following each other? Like, Oh, that's good. Yeah. You going if they jump off a bridge, you going to jump off with them? Because mm-hmm. that's my life. Mm-hmm. I'm not jumping off. Yo, y'all go ahead. I'm going a, I'm to a be back on my way home like now. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going home. I'm going home. <laughs> and so I think oftentimes you find yourself following the crowd instead of being the leader of the crowd. Yeah. And 
you have to be the leader of the crowd because you can point them the right way. Yeah. Which is what I'm trying to do in my school. Like, we don't have to fight and you don't have to do drugs to, right. like, suppress your pain. Like, you can, like, there is someone who genuinely cares for you. If you don't know them yet, like, you can get to know them. Right. So, yeah. That's good. That's good, yeah. I think that um, that's that's an awesome message because a lot of people, they don't, a lot of you, a lot of you, um, Young people, they don't they don't realize that there is somebody that cares so much for them, and there's friends that are trying to live right and trying to do right. Mm-hmm. Um, they may be far and few between, but if you just open up and talk to people, you yeah. know, you can find uh, you can find your tribe. Because um, I remember, I'm you know, I'm, I'm I'm a people's person. I'm like the most introverted, extroverted person you'll ever meet in your life. Because I don't like people, but I love people. Um, it's a it's a contradictory statement, but that's my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real estate ever. I don't like people, but I love people. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I like to, I like to get connected and find something that, mm-hmm. you know, we can reason on. But the biggest challenge with that is that, you know, even if people live in alternative lifestyles or learn or live in a way that is contrary to my faith, I still try to find common ground that we can, um, that we can find reasoning on so that we can at least have some type of friendship I believe that the biggest way that you can be a light to somebody is by how you live your life around them, mm-hmm. even when they don't necessarily their lifestyle and, or whatever they do don't necessarily agree with your lifestyle. Yep, it's perfectly fine. But if you continue to be a light, continue to love people, continue to show the love of Christ towards them and towards everyone that's around you, whether they are Christian or not, that's how you draw people in. Um, yeah. And I say that because it's so important as a young person, as yourself, and as anyone else that's listening uh, or watching, that you understand your identity as a kingdom citizen, as a kingdom kid. Um, one thing that I I will say that I regretfully did was I sacrificed my kingdom identity when I was in high school so much so that I could fit in, so I could do all these different things. Um, and if there's one thing that I truly regret, it is doing those things to try to fit in and be a part of the crowd. Yeah. Um, because as you get older, you realize, and you, you know, we say we don't, we live life with no regrets, yeah. but there are things that you do you wish do that you could take back. Mm-hmm. You do. There are things that you wish that you could have not said. Yeah. <laughs> there are things that you wish that you could have not done. Like if I had waited, you know, it could have been better. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we learn from those experiences. Yes. But uh, we also make sure that we, reach back and let people know, like, okay, this is what I did. I don't want you to make those same mistakes yeah. and those same things either. Um, so do you have any questions, anything for me? Um, I mean, honestly, I think and this is completely off topic, but do you feel like your generation doesn't believe in our generation leading churches? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think I think that is I would say a double a double edged answer response. Number one, we're still battling that same thing with our older generation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> because they're older they're, the older generation is just not ready to let go of the range yet. Yeah. Because they're not ready to let go of the range. You see so many people falling to different sins and issues and things moral failures and you know this pastor cheating on his wife or this pastor you know doing that and so they're stepping down um and because of that you see them getting burnt out pretty quickly pretty fastly yeah on the contrary you see you have hungry people like me like other um preachers like other men and women of god who are ready to take on these things but it's all in one God's timing when those things happen, and two, it's all in when the older generation feels comfortable and ready to let that thing go. I will say this: I have seen a shift in where, and I've spoken on this on the podcast before, and I've spoken to this to a lot of other people. Um, I'm not a prophet, but I do speak prophetically sometimes. <laughs> when the Lord gives me something, I just got to say it. But I have seen like a shift to where the older generation is starting to, you know, it's a shifting or it's a changing of the guard. So 
the, those old gatekeepers, those old generals are now slowly kind of being pulled out mm-hmm. and God is replacing them with our generation, mm-hmm. with new people that's coming in. They're going to be the new gatekeepers, the new generals. I feel like our generation, though, is way more open to reaching back to your generation, yeah. finding somebody that we can connect with and pull them up. And we walk alongside them. The problem is, it's just that continual shift has to continue to happen. Yeah. So the more the more time, the more opportunities and the more platforms, the more things that, you know, we are exposed to. This is me personally. I can talk about this. I try to pull back and reach back and pull other people up. I try to help other people with that. So if I get an opportunity to do X, Y, and Z. I try to make sure that, okay, case in point, I have a podcast. I I brought you up. Um, But when I started my podcast, I was always, like, pulling other people up, too. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, look at this person. Look at that person. You know, put your eyes on them. Yeah. Even though it's my podcast, Mm. I'm always trying to, like, put people on because that's just my true nature. I feel like there's more people that's like that, that wants to put other people on, wants to help out. And I think that the more that becomes more of a kingdom mindset and a kingdom agenda, then we'll be more, I would say, I would say more people will be more open and receptive to the younger generation, pulling, pulling them up and just teaching them because there's a lot of things that you still have to go through in life. There's a lot of things, a lot of life lessons that you still have to experience. It's not to say, or not to knock the gift that is in you guys, and it's not to say anything that, you know, you cannot do it. Mm-hmm. It's just that you have to continue to live through some stuff. Yeah. So that you can have a testimony so that you can actually speak to some stuff. Yeah. That older people can listen to and can respect and can respond to. Um, even if you preach, even if you're singing, even if you're doing whatever your gift is, praying for yeah. them. And it's not to invalidate the gift and the call that's in you. You know, I think that the older generation has has done a great job of invalidating our gifts by not giving us those 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 opportunities and and things like that. Our generation, I can I can confidently say this because I see it so much. We don't want to do <laughs> what the older generation did. No, we don't want to follow in those things footsteps. We want to carve our own path. We want to do our own things. We want to do what's best for the kingdom, and what's best for the kingdom is. I want to pour into you. I want to bring you up. I want you to be my successor. But in order to do that, I have to show you things. I have to yeah. walk with you. I have to disciple you. Like, you know, you get it? Get and it. so those things are more prevalent in our generation. Mm-hmm. And I feel like we will be more receptive to the younger generation and more eager to pull them up and to give them more opportunities to do things yeah. than the older generation. Um, and I think a lot of people just feel like if they, it can be competition based, (laughs) you know, there's competition in the church, uh, and there's competition in Christianity, but if we set aside our egos, set aside our competitive nature and just truly see things for what it is, it's like, you may be a more gifted speaker than me. Okay. then I'm going to give you the opportunity and the platform to speak. Like there's other ways to use your to utilize your gifts and things mm-hmm. like that in other in other ways in that way. Am I making sense? Yeah. Okay. No, I understand. Okay. Because I I feel like that's something that is going to continue to be a topic over the course of the next few decades. To be honest with you, um, because you're now seeing our generation, and when I say my generation, I'm talking about. Like, what are we considered, Terrence? We're like Gen Millennials. Millennials. Yeah. <laughs> Terrence said, I'm 40. I'm not a millennial. I am. <laughs> I am something else. Gen X, probably. <laughs> He's not a baby boomer. You're not a baby boomer. <laughs> but um, I do think that our generation will be more open and more receptive. And I mean, but I will say this too because. You'll find some people that that may or may not allow those things, but it just it really depends on the heart of that individual, yeah. and if they have a heart to really pour out and pour into other people and allow people to have those opportunities to do things. 
I definitely feel like, you know, that's 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 a topic that's going to continue to happen because I know my heart, you know. I if I, if I ever have a, a platform or church or anything, you know, I'm and if I know you got the gift, you going to preach. You gonna, yeah. <laughs> like as my uncle will say, I'm going to draw some blood out of you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to make sure you get uh, all the experience that you need. And it's not because like I feel like, you know, I'm not. I'm trying to like take vacations and stuff like that, as most people would think. As you know, when pastors go away for a five, for a while, I'm like, oh, he just he don't never want to do no. It's, <laughs> I, you want to give people opportunities. And that's what they be hating on Pastor Mike for, right? I, yeah, exactly. like, that's why. And that's why I was going with that because yeah, they, they be hating on him. <laughs> they be hating like, on him. They're like he don't never preach. Just like the man be preaching he for be like preaching. six months straight, right? <laughs> Let the man go and rest. He got four kids. Like, <laughs> and it's not even he resting. He's preaching at a different church. Right. He's spreading the gospel. Right. He is out here. So I think that, you know, our generation it will we'll start to see that more. You know, yeah. we'll, we give more opportunities. Um, and I'm not saying that any and everybody is going to have those opportunities. No, it's, if you're truly gifted, if you truly have that gift, and that is something that the Lord has shown that individual and say, you know, bring them up and do, give them an opportunity. They're going to do it. I usually just I know a lot of people ask me about my testimony. That is one big thing. You I wanna, always get asked. Yeah. You wanna share your testimony? I was gonna ask you, but I, I mean, didn't I, can. I didn't know you if you had any more questions for me. Um I mean I can. You want me to? Yeah. Well, I was adopted when I was two years old. Um and I was I didn't know until I was eight. My sister, she told me on the stairs I was getting punished. I was on the stairs in Time Mountain. She told me. Lord. And she's like, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, my parents were like, oh. <laughs> oh, see, You know, it's my funny. big mouth ran, and I was like, am I adopted? <laughs> and my parents were like, what? what? <laughs> they, they, they were taken back. But you know what's funny? I, and I'll, I'll let you get back to your to your testament. My sister used to tell me that all the time when I was a kid growing up. That's why he was adopted. <laughs> and I'm like, I was adopted? Mom and no, you won't adopt it. Come on now. It's something that siblings do, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. But yeah, um, so I found out and I think I was never the same. Mm-hmm. And when I turned, I don't know, maybe 11, 12, I got in a bad friend group mm-hmm. and I just stopped caring. But I grew up in church. Mm-hmm. So, you know, my mom always made sure like we were always in church until around the age of probably eight. Mm-hmm. And then we end up, the pastor ended up cheating on his wife and brought my parents into it. And so mm-hmm. we ended up leaving the church, mm-hmm. which a lot of them did. Yeah. So question for you, when you found out at eight that you were mm-hmm. adopted, that makes you feel some type of way. Why did that make you feel some type of way? What was the, your thoughts? What were your emotions at eight learning um, that you're adopted? I mean, I'm eight, like, I don't got no brain cells yet, like, <laughs> I'm barely, I'm in elementary. Um, when I did find out, I think, I don't know, I don't, I mean, like, I remember it, but it's, like, blurry, like, mm-hmm. I remember, like, my sister was like, no, I'm not, like, you're adopted, which right. she is too, obviously, <laughs> but I didn't put that in my mind. You didn't mind. put two and two together. I didn't put two and two together. You didn't have a comeback. And so, no, <laughs> I really didn't. I was like, oh, but um, I think I... I, like, at the age of, like, maybe 10, like, my parents were, like, we're not going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm eight. What? Like, yeah, they're not going to sit me down and talk to me. Yeah, because you're not going to understand it I'm not going to understand anything. I don't know. I remember I kept asking my parents, like, Mm -hmm. am I adopted? Like, Mm -hmm. what's, like, give me the tea. Like, what's up? Yeah. And they finally sat us down, um, and they told us we Mm -hmm. were adopted. And... They gave me, like, the reasoning on why, like, mm-hmm. my parents were in and out of jail. Mm-hmm. They couldn't, like, be stable for us. Mm-hmm. And so they took us in, mm-hmm. which that's my half on. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's not like it was a complete stranger who didn't know us. Like, it's, they're it's still family. family, right? Yeah. Um, And so she was letting me know, like, and I was like, I remember feeling anger. And I don't mm-hmm. know if it was towards her or if it was directed at my biological parents. But I mm-hmm. remember just feeling like, I remember, I think I was crying as well. Mm-hmm. When they had told, like, when they finally, like, sat us down. You feel like that they, like, your whole life up to that point was, like, a lie? Yeah. yeah. I think, like, I was, like, I felt abandoned. And I mm. think from there was, like, the downhill of mm. my life. Like, So, you know, I always hear that, you know, when people are adopted, that they feel abandoned, you know, once they find out. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Do you think that it's because, you know, you're thinking about your own parents, you know, your own. Oh, yeah, for sure. And do you think that it's in it? All right. So do you think that it's a bad thing or how can I how can I phrase this correctly? It's like. How do you think that the people who took you in, you know, feel that you feel like abandoned and they're like, no, we've been here with you all this time. Like, you're not abandoned. Well, I didn't express that feeling with them. It was in my mind, I think. Mm -hmm. I know, like, I definitely had, like, anger towards them mm-hmm. and resentment, and I think... But it was more towards your parents. It was more towards my parents, but I took okay. it out on them because they were there. Because they were there, yeah. And I, I find that as a, a, a semi-common theme because it's like, I guess you're, because you're processing. Mm-hmm. You're trying to process, you know, the emotions and the feels, and you're kind of, like, mentally and, and emotionally, you know, you're all over the place because you're trying to, you know, I like just... Come to understand. some kind of reasoning, yeah, yeah, and understand why, yeah. So, um, and then I guess like I really like I it was just like really bad, like from probably eleven to thirteen, mm. it was like the worst part of my life. Like, um, I found a bad friend group in my middle school, and I rolled with it. Like my sixth grade year, I got in a fight. Mm-hmm. So Mind you got hands. I <laughs> I got hands, but it was embarrassing. Like, and then even like watched the video back like a couple months ago, and I was like, "Ew!" Like, get that yeah. off my phone. Yeah. Like, what was I even doing? <laughs> and so um, I got suspended, obviously. And then mm-hmm. I was still in the I don't care phase. Like, yeah. okay, I'm suspended. Mm-hmm. So what? Like, mm-hmm. what about it? Yeah. And my parents, like, my attitude sucked, mm-hmm. and I was like, you know, like I found vaping, and I. Th- and all my friends vaped. So mm-hmm. it was like, okay, obviously I'm not going to be the odd one out here. So right. I remember just vaping and like doing whatever I wanted. Like, and my parents obviously didn't know yeah. because I was a sneaky little child. Like <laughs> I definitely was on the down low about everything. Yeah. And, um, probably, I don't know, the age of like 12, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe 13. I remember, like, it was a bad, it was, we were on a code red at our school. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling really scared. And I was like, God, if you get me out of this, I'm going to stop vaping, God. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to go home. Right. And <laughs> trying to go to the house. Like, to, Jesus, please. And so he, I got out of it. And mm-hmm. I was like, okay. And I threw my vapes away. Mm-hmm. And I think that was like, I'm done. Mm-hmm. But I then found, I had to find a new way to cope. Mm-hmm. And it was like, I was searching yeah. and instead of going to him, I was like, he can't love me. Like mm. I've done X, Y, and Z. Like why would he still love me, yeah. be, have a relationship with me? Mm. And so I remember, um, I f- like my sister at the time, my sister was going through a lot, like spiritually, emotionally, physically, like she ended up going like com- being committed to the psych ward. Like it was, she was going through a lot. Wow. And so I like, and we shared a room. So I saw everything my parents didn't see, like Mm -hmm. her trying to kill herself. Like I saw that. So when she got committed, like, I think my depression ended up like, like I had it, but I didn't like have it into effect until she left. And then it like got hit. mm -hmm. And I found a a blade and I just started slicing my hands. Mm -hmm. And, of course, my parents, like, they didn't know. They, because I was, I was always in my room. I was yeah. a child who was in my room, like, all day, never left. Yeah. And so that was a lot for me, like. And I just did it, and I didn't know why I did it. And mm. my therapist at the time, which I hated therapy. I was not talking to her. Right. <laughs> like, I'm so, like, I'm why do I need therapy? Right. Which now, like, to this day, I'm in therapy, and I love therapy. Yeah. Like, that's my favorite time of the week. Um, but yeah, I just didn't talk to my therapist and I ignored her, her presence, (laughs) her phone calls, (laughs) I ignored it all. So when she like, I don't know why, but she like, she had never done this, but she was like, take your jacket off. Mm. It's like a hundred degrees out. Like, why do you have a jacket on? I was like, I don't know. I'm cold. And she was like, we're outside. Take it off. I was like, no, I'm not taking it off. And she's like, okay, then show me your arms. Mm. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, well, you ain't never asked me that. Like, (laughs) and she was like, pull it up. And I was like, okay. And I have bracelets. Obviously, I'm smart. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm going to put bracelets to, right. covered them up. Um, and so she's like, those bracelets, like, you never wear bracelets outside. Like, what What are you doing? And I was like, nothing. And she was like, then take the bracelets off. And I was like, I'm not taking my bracelets off. And she was like, take them off. And I was like, I'm not. 
And I started to walk away, and she grabs my arm, and she slides one of them off. She, she, she like, sees it. She sees it. And then she's like, well, I'm going to have to report this to your parents. And I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> like, <laughs> you do this. <laughs> you blew up my spot. Like, <laughs> like what are you doing? Yeah. And she was like, I'm under, like, some liability and more stuff. Yeah. My parents found out. Of course, I lied to them. I lied through my teeth. I was like, Sparky cut me. I didn't do it. Like, my dog did it. And yeah. she was like, okay. Oh, my mom bought it at the time. Mm-hmm. I was like, thank you. <laughs> my God, thank you. Because they were going to, like, take the door off my room. Yeah. Like, you yeah. know. And so I then still did it, like, until it got to more, like, something mm. more. And it was like, I needed something more, like, Cutting only works temporarily. Yeah. It's not permanent fix. Yeah. And so probably my end of like near near the middle of my eighth grade year, I was going through a lot mentally and physically, yeah. like anxiety attacks, like it was bad. Like I was seeing like the devil like in my head, like it was really bad. I had no connection. Wow. And I was still going to focus youth at the time. That was wow. crazy. And I, like, didn't know what to do. And Mm. so I remember just coming home, and I grabbed a bottle of pills. And I was Mm. just going to kill my life, like, kill myself right there. And my phone rang, and it was my best friend. Um, And then she answered, and I answered her, and she was like, what are you, like, what's up? Like, what are you doing? I was like, nothing. And it's, like, 3 o'clock in the morning. Wow. And she's like, God woke me up. Like, you're you're doing something. Wow. And I was like, I'm not. And she's like, I'm coming over. And then when she got there, I was, like, breaking down, and I told her I was going to kill myself. And she wow. she prayed over me, and then, like, right then and there, it was like, wow. you, don't, like you don't need this anymore. Wow. And so I ended up, like, connecting with a youth leader. I'm not going to name job, I <laughs> but I connected with a youth leader, and she really helped me out. And then from there, I guess, like, my mental health slowly started to improve, and yeah. yeah. So, and then... Camp 2023, I gave my life to God, and then I came home, and I got got water baptized. Um, Yay. (laughs) And so ever since then, like, I've just been, like, a leader to the younger generation, and, like, I love serving in kids. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's my testimony. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. No, I I, I remember hearing your testimony. Um, I think they played it on the before camp, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it was... It was earlier this year when they played it, um, and I remember hearing it. And I remember it was, it was so beautiful because yeah, um, everyone was crying. Yeah, and I was I was trying to hide my face. Yeah. I, I think because you know, you most adults we don't we don't take into account that you know you're really going like yeah at such a young age you're going through this yeah thing. yep exactly because most of us we didn't go through the things that you guys are have, have went through and are going through in our in our lives yeah. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that the times are just different. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were brought up, we were outside, we were doing a whole bunch of stuff. We didn't have time to be in our room and do stuff and whatever yeah. and be isolated um, like that. And even if we were, you know, it was you're, you're about to go to bed or something, right. <laughs> or something like that. Um, but there was more community and there was more things. Um, but I also I also speak to this too. Um, families like. Now there were like broken homes. There were people I knew people that were like adopted and mm-hmm. things like that, and that that struggled with with that. But families was was just so stronger back then. Mm-hmm. Like now, yeah, I knew that there were some of my friends. They didn't have their dad growing up, or they didn't have their mom, or whatever. Um, but for the majority of my upbringing, I remember seeing a bunch of people that had you know most of my friends had yeah both of their parents, yeah. um, their biological parents. Even if they were adopted, they were, they still had a good relationship with their parents and whatnot. <clears throat> but, you know, the thing is, is like as adults, you can't diminish or you can't belittle what other people are going through. Yeah. Especially youth. Um, because you just assume that everything is all good and gravy and it's they not, could be going through something yeah. at home that nobody, that they're not telling nobody. Um, and I've, I've witnessed that firsthand, um, even as... In eighth grade, yeah, eighth, seventh, eighth grade year, um, we had a girl in our school, um, very pretty girl, very um, popular. Everyone knew her. Everyone mm-hmm. loved her. Um, my best friend had, like, the biggest crush on her. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, you know, she was a very, very, very gifted kid. 
um, never knew the things that she was going through in yeah. her house. And, um, and unfortunately, she took her life. And that rocked us. Like, now, when she took her life, that was, we were in high school by that time. But, um, but that rocked us because it's like we never knew what and she what she was going through. And it's like, but, you know, she was a beautiful person. Like, why? Yeah. And I think a lot of us had that question, like, was why? Um, and I just remember, like, yeah. just going through all of that and dealing with that and just trying to understand the why. It's, it's, it goes to, like, to what I was saying earlier. It's like we can't belittle what people are going through. Yeah. And we can't think that, oh, well, you're a kid. You, you're you not going through X, Y, and Z. No. There are things that, you know, that you're going through that yeah. you're afraid to tell an adult. I remember there were things that I was going through and I was afraid to tell my parents. There's things that I, my dad is, my dad is here. To, <laughs> he's, he's here. And he's actually living with, with me right now. But there's things that I have <laughs> not told him. <laughs> I take yeah. it to the grave, but <laughs> but at this, <laughs> I'm in a much better place now, y'all. But there, <laughs> good job, TJ. <laughs> <laughs> but there are things that's like you know you just you just don't know who to go to, uh, yeah. and how to express those things, and how to you know um, have an outlet for those things. One thing that you shared in your testimony that was beautiful was a youth leader. You connected with a youth leader, and she helped you with mm-hmm. that. That's how my mentor was with me. Um, when I got connected with my mentor, um, he literally took me under his wings and did a lot for me. Yeah. Um, now, I, it did not stop me from doing the dumb things that I still did. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he was very heavy and strong in my life and trying to keep me away from stuff and I was still doing it. Yeah. But he was consistent. You know, he was always in my life checking on me and doing things at the time, like always making sure that I was, you know, doing X, Mm -hmm. Y, and Z. And that is so key for, I would feel like for any young adult and even for any person that's my age or older, you know, invest into a young person's life, Mm -hmm. you know, constantly be consistent in their life, constantly check in. Because I think about, and the young lady, her name was Maya. I think about Maya all the time, you know, and I, I know a lot of other people that were our age, they think about her all the time too. Um, because it's like, what could we have done to, to like, to try to yeah. save her life? Um, I will, I'm, I'll, I'll be honest. I will sit here. I'm not going to, um, act like I never had those moments. Yeah. Like a part of my testimony was, um, I got to the point where I was going to kill myself. I was going to do it. Like I was committed. I was in my room ready. To toast. Ready. <laughs> and then the sad part is I didn't have anything to do with it. I was just. <laughs> <laughs> no plan. No plan. I was just, I was just going to do it. I was like, I don't know. Just, but I was in my room and I was just committed because, um, and this was honestly, this was, this wasn't, um, this was when I was in college. Um, mm-hmm. This was my sophomore year. Not sophomore. This is my, um, yeah, sophomore year in college. Um, and I just was going through so much with my mom, yeah. um, with, uh, my relationship with, um, still mourning the loss of my best friend. Um, and it was just so heavy yeah. at the time. And it was just, it was like, it was just hitting me all at all angles. It's like, yeah. I felt, I felt like there's, I can't take no more. Like I would just, I'd rather just be gone. Yeah. And I remember just laying on my floor, just crying. And I had made up in my mind that I'm going to do it that night. And I just remember the Lord speaking to me and said, TJ, get up. It's going to be all right. Like, if I didn't hear the Lord's voice, I would not be here. Yeah. But God loves me so much that he stepped in in that moment. Yeah. He knew where my heart was. Like, he knew exactly where I was mentally. And he stepped in and said, get up. It's going to be all right. That has carried me <laughs> the entire way. the entire my entire way. Yeah. Like even when times, I'm not saying I'm suicidal now, y'all. Just stop. <laughs> 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 but even in times when I want to give up and I just want to mm-hmm. stop doing stuff, like I ain't doing this no more. Like I, I joke and kid all the time. Like I I want to stop doing this podcast because it's like it's so much work. And when I be want ready to stop and ready to quit, 
It's like I just hear God say, "It's gonna be all right. Don't yeah. quit. Just keep going. Just keep going." When it gets when it gets tough, as an older person, you know, you know, we deal with a lot: finances, kids, life, work, everything. He's like, "I'll be like, all right. I need to throw up my hands. I'm I'm done. You're done." Yeah. And God is like, "Nope. Keep going. It's gonna be all right." Because one thing I learned about life is that things always get better. Yeah. It always gets better. No matter how dark and how hard it may seem, it always gets better. And I'll say this, like I well, I've told you, I told you personally, you know, I believe in your gift. I believe in you. I believe in what God is doing in your life. Um, and I wholeheartedly <laughs> support everything that, you know, that you do um, and support the gift that is in you. I remember when we were, um, what was it? Was it like VTE or some kind of rally? We had to come up with that that stupid oh, chant. Oh, yes. I carried y'all. <laughs> you carried so, us. You were the reason why we got the W, know. you know? I know. I've been told. But <laughs> but it was me hyping you up. Let me yeah. stop. Um, <laughs> because you was, yeah. like, cause you was like, I don't know. I'm scared. Um, I don't want to do it. Because, like, the rest of them weren't in rhythm. Like, guys, come on. <laughs> Pastor Carlos, we love you. But, like, right. come on. <laughs> right? But, you know, but I, I fully believe that you have such an amazing gift. God has, you know, amazing gifts inside of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to help you in that way to, you know, fully realize your gifts and fully realize all that God has for you um, the best way I can. And and I definitely believe that, you know, the Lord has his hand on your life. And it's the reason why you're still here. It's yeah. the reason why, you know, he did not allow Satan to take you out. Um, even with everything that you've dealt with, everything that you've gone through, I truly believe that what God has for you will far exceed all the things that you went through in your life. Mm-hmm. And even the things that you're going to go through in your life as you get older, you know, you'll be reminded of how God showed up in your life mm-hmm. in the past, you know, through your testimony. Yeah. You know, so. All right. Maya, you have anything to send the people off with? Um, always like believe in yourself, like never give up. That's it. That's it. That's it. (laughs) That's the, that's that's literally it. it. Believe in yourself. Never give up. Jesus love. (laughs) love (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Right. All right. I love you, Miley. Love you too, TJ. Thank you for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you can follow us. On social media at We Are One Faith, um, on all podcast streaming platforms, just type in One Faith Podcast or We Are One Faith. Whichever one comes up, you'll find us. And we're on YouTube, um, One Faith Podcast, or at We Are One, or YouTube.com forward slash We Are One Faith. You can find us like, anywhere. Um, just look up, or you can look up me, TJ McKnight, TL McKnight. Jr. And somehow, some way, you should find a podcast. Somehow. If not, you know. Take it up with, with God. <laughs> How can they find you, Miley? Um, guys, my account's private, so if I don't know you, I'm not going to request you. I'm just going to let you know. Yeah, don't be but creepy. Don't be creepy. She's yeah, a teenager. Guys, I'm 15. She's Minor. 15. <laughs> um, Miley underscore W22. Good. Love you, Miley. Love you, too.